Hi everyone, I'm Adam Chodak. Welcome to the Foundation Fighting Blindness podcast. This special Beacon Story episode is sponsored by Alkeus Pharmaceuticals. I want to welcome Deborah Chikoski to the podcast. Before we get into everything that you are, a paratriathlete and all that, I want to say at the outset that you, like me, have Stargardt disease. So why don't we talk about when you were diagnosed, how old you were, that type of thing, if you don't mind. Again, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I, I don't mind at all. I was 14 when I actually started noticing changes in my vision. And my two older sisters, who are two years and five years older than me, had already been diagnosed with Stargardt's disease. So we knew what we were looking for. And by we, my retinal specialist. So we had, uh, my twin sister and I had been tested every year since they had been diagnosed. And at 14, I started noticing changes in my vision and I knew I had it right away because I already knew what the symptoms were. So I was diagnosed when I was 15, but 14 is when I started seeing changes in my central vision. And what happened after that? How did that initially impact you both physically and emotionally? Physically, I was really competitive in sports in middle school, high school, and I actually wanted to be a professional soccer player. So that was a little bit of a blow, knowing I was going to lose my central vision and not be able to track the ball as well. And and then, you know, mentally, it, I knew I had some prep because of my other older two sisters had already been diagnosed and had already walked through that initial phase. So I would say I probably had a little bit more prep in what to expect. But, you know, when you realize at 14, you're not getting your driver's license at 15, 16. I mean, it, it took it took a little bit to kind of regroup and mourn the loss of that vision and then, you know, take that next step forward. How has your perspective changed over the years? So I actually so I've had it longer I've, I've lived longer with it than without it. So I actually don't remember it, having that central vision. So it's been so long, but I would say, you know, I, I still kind of relate it to bowling. You put the guardrails up, but you can still bowl. Um, it just kind of helps keep you what your parameters are. I mean, I can't drive, but I still, you know, have a family, uh, have two girls and still able to, like you said, in the beginning, um, pursuing a professional career in triath paratriathlon. So it definitely is a part of who I am, but it certainly doesn't define me. When you hear the word Stargardt, what comes to mind? What do you think about when you hear that word, that disease? No central vision, but honestly, you know, as I even become more educated in what it does to my eyes, it I have more of a broader scale, but I would say if I'm trying to explain it to somebody else, that central vision deteriorating pretty quickly for me and then my light receptor cells kind of going out from the center out are also damaged and dying. So I kind of refer to it as a black hole in the middle of my eyes and those are the dead cells and then kind of it's kind of working its way out. What would treatment or a cure mean to you at this point for Stargardt? For me, again, I've been living with it for over 20 years. You know, I I really have adapted to the changes in my vision. If it were to stop the the progress, that would be that would be amazing. You know, I like I mentioned, I also have two kids and the progress, the cures and especially diagnosing them early, you know, if that were to continue and I know it has progressed quite a bit. If they can stop them at onset, if they were to um, have the genetic disease themselves, that would be, I mean, it'd be totally worth it for me to know that my kids will have, you know, the ability to drive and not have central vision loss. Have you been genetically tested for the ABCA4 gene? I'm actually in the process. <laughs> I just a couple months ago started the process, so I haven't yet, but I'm, I'm in the process of doing it. What tools have helped you in this journey? So again, it's been a progression and it's also been a progression of me accepting it as a 15 year old, 16 year old, you're going to college. 
So I would say through college, my parents were really a big advocate for me of making sure that I could have the extra time and the, you know, large fonts and stuff like that. And then the New York State Commission, now that I'm living in New York, having that ability to get the magnifiers that I need, because it's, again, it's genetic and it's degenerative. So it's over time, it's getting worse. And so, you know, my magnifiers have changed and being able to, again, travel the world and navigate airports by myself sometimes. Um, you know, I have a I have a, a white cane that I use. I also have a service dog, especially at, we're so active. We walk all over the place. Um, so she helps too. And there's been some, you know, even some telescope glasses so I can read, you know, what my kids bring in home papers and technology that I could set on a desk and be able to, again, get all these documents and fill them out myself um, has been really helpful. And I would say even over the last 10 years, the technology has just gotten so great and accessible to us. When did you start competing in triathlons? How did this come about? So I wanted to become a professional soccer player that wasn't going to work out, you know, not being able to see the ball straight on and then being able to track it. So I knew I was going to need to switch and stay active. My undergrad is in exercise science. I just, I love how the body works and how you can make it better and faster and more healthy. So I, my senior year of college, someone asked me, had I ever heard of a triathlon where you swim, bike and run all at the same time. And I knew that it seemed really challenging to put all three together. So I actually did my first triathlon as just a single athlete, not even in para for in 2000, uh, 2008. So I, I participated for a while. And then as my eyes continued to progress, where it became unsafe to cycle on the road or swim by myself, I took a break. Actually, my, my anxiety got so bad that I just, I wasn't sure if I could safely participate anymore. So I took a break, actually had my two, my two girls. And then my husband said, well, why don't you try paratriathlon? It made its debut in the Paralympics in 2016. And so I had my first daughter then. So um, yeah, so then in 2019, uh, my community here is amazing and there's triathletes here and one of them said they'd love to do it with me. So in 2020, we're supposed to do our first paratriathlon together and nothing happened in 2020. So 2021, I did my first paratriathlon and just knew that this is something that I could do on the professional level. So through uh, talent ID camp that USA Triathlon put on and with just you know, really feeling a call to pursue paratriathlon professionally. In 2022, I became professional. I've been uh, racing with Team USA since then. That's incredible. What's the ultimate goal for you? Well, I wanted to go to Paris this year, but I just missed the team. Uh, but that's okay. I, I've learned so much and have come away with a lot, you know, more than just, you know, being athletic and performing optimally. Just there's a it just transfers a lot. Just my mental game is so much better. And as my eyes change, being able to accept that and move on, uh, you know, not move on, but move through it and adapt with it. It's just helped a lot. And I know showing my girls that even if they end up getting it, you know, they still can pursue whatever they want to. So that's been really beneficial for me. But I think ultimately just um, probably another year or two on the professional level and then I want to move into coaching. I love that. You're going to make an amazing coach. And that kind of gets into my next question is what message do you have for anyone recently diagnosed, newly diagnosed with a blinding disease like Stargardt's? Definitely take your time in you know, understanding everything that's happening. I had the benefit of watching my other two sisters walk through it. So there definitely is a mourning process and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, in a in a society that is driven by cars and being able to get places, it is hard having two young kids living in western New York where it snows <laughs> in the winters to be able to navigate that. But, you know, once I understood, hey, this is happening, you know, it was actually my dad that summer said, hey, I don't want you to give up sports. So what do we need to do to get you to continue to play? And so, you know, he actually took me to practice basketball, to shoot 
looking away from the basket to still be able to make it in the basket. And it really just, I just kept that momentum and still wanting to be healthy and to take care of myself. And then it just, it just translates. So definitely give yourself that time to say, okay, this, this is happening, you know, educate yourself on what are my resources available and then plug yourself into a community that's going to help you. I have my community stretches very wide on people that are willing to help with the girls and getting them places and getting me places. And, you know, again, still traveling the world, being able to race for, you know, for paratriathlon and, um, you know, nobody can limit you. Uh, you're going to be the only one that limits you. Deborah, thank you so much for the inspiration and your time and for sharing your story. Oh, you're welcome. This special Foundation Fighting Blindness Beacon Story podcast episode was sponsored by Alkeus Pharmaceuticals.